pleased to be here to tell you a little bit about the trait of eye sensitivity and highly sensitive people. I wouldn't be surprised if many of you, this is the first time you've heard about the trait of eye sensitivity. It's a little known, but very important inherited trait shared by 15 to 20 percent of the population, which is about 50 million Americans. But it isn't really widely known. It turns out that uh, children have different temperaments. A good example is you go to kindergarten and you may see of 10 kids going in, eight of them will rush right in and have no, uh, throw abandon to the wind. The other two may hang back and be processing incoming information. It's uh, pausing to check is one of the main characteristics of highly sensitive people. They are more in tune with incoming subtleties and changes in their environment, which is sometimes confused for being afraid. And we'll go back to the, the kindergarten again. If you go to a kindergarten and you see the teachers, particularly the untrained teachers who might come up and go, what's wrong? Are you a scary cat? What are you afraid of? So all of a sudden they've got a label on themselves that they're doing something wrong. Where actually it's a matter that highly sensitive people have a different nervous system. And they process incoming information much more deeply than non-HSPs which, uh, once again, can be seen as being afraid, but it's having a different nervous system. I first learned about the trait of eye sensitivity uh, at a learning annex nearly 10 years ago from Dr. Elaine Aaron, who wrote a book, The Highly Sensitive Person, How to Survive in an Overwhelming World. And it's a terrific book I recommend highly. And I was dating at that time a young lady who was different than anyone I'd ever dated. She was very bright, but seemed to be affected by subtleties in her environment and would also ruminate on things and would worry about things. And that was very strange to me because I'd always been with people who, who hadn't. And at that time, I was going to the Learning Annex. I was lucky enough to have someone who worked there so I could get into any and all Learning Annex seminars that I wanted to, so I saw everything from uh, age regression to uh, motivational speakers to Dr. Elaine Aaron speaking on the trait of high sensitivity. She explained that 15 to 20 percent of the population has it and that it, it, it is inherited. So if you find someone in your family who is highly sensitive, there will probably be someone else along the uh, genetic chain that will also have it and it's a great relief to people. I own a website called HighlySensitivePeople.com and if you'd like to learn more about this you can visit HighlySensitivePeople.com. I am amazed at the people visited from all over the world. I think I now average about 180,000 hits a month. People type in in Google highly sensitive or super sensitive or ultra sensitive and my website comes up. I have voice messages and emails from people virtually every day. I almost dread going back and opening up my email because I know there's going to be a whole lot of them. I have people who will call up and leave a message on my answering machine saying, I thought I was all alone. I thought I was crazy. I, th I thought I was the only one who, who had these feelings. It's been said that it's almost like they're from another planet. They just don't feel like they fit in on this planet. So it is something that I am thrilled to be able to get a chance to tell people about. Some of the characteristics include being very meticulous, the pausing to check, being affected by other people's moods. There is an article, and I have a copy of it here, uh, in this month's Oprah magazine. and. In it, on page 63, it talks about sponge people. And they seem bewildered by it, but any highly sensitive person, and I know I've got both highly sensitive people and non-highly sensitive people in the audience, they talk about how there are people whose moods can change and they can either be angry or anxious or upset. And it's because, they find out, that people give off energy. 
I'm in the world of, you know, it's filled with energy. And if you're around people who are negative or depressed or have other issues, and you're a highly sensitive person, I'm not saying that all highly sensitive people do this, but they are affected by it. I was recently on a radio show, and a gentleman called in, and he said going to a mall was horrible for him, because he'd walk around a little, and he'd be picking up on the energy of other people in the mall. To those of you who are not HSP, this may sound weird or unbelievable or irrational or uh, unbelievable, we'll go with that, but it happens to happen and it happens to happen so regularly, I know there is some validity to it. So uh, uh, go with that. The interesting part is in our society, it's not really embraced. Uh, the American way is to be uh, gung-ho, go for it, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, grin and bear it. Highly sensitive people who, by their nature, pause to check and are processing things and ruminating on information, it takes them a lot longer. And in a society where to be aggressive is, is the ideal, the idea of being a highly sensitive person and processing deeply, maybe taking until the next day until you can come up and have thought about it enough. I'm seeing some people nod in the audience that say, I also was going to mention highly sensitive people that are also known as HSP. So I sometimes uh, shorthand it and say HSPs or non-HSPs. There are people who say, wait a second, I am highly sensitive and they're offended that I might say that there are certain people that I perceive as being highly sensitive than others. They say, I care about people, I'm a nice person. And I explained that the trait of high sensitivity is a differentiation of the nervous system. So it is both physiological as well as psychological. It's a trait that can be considered having positives and negatives. And the positives are the highly sensitive person is gifted. One of the lines I like, and I think it's absolutely true, is that not all gifted people are highly sensitive, but all highly sensitive people are gifted. I will later tell you some of the people I consider who, who demonstrate the trait of high sensitivity. Highly sensitive people think, what if? Not always what is. Non-highly sensitive people or non-HSPs may go, what is the situation? What do I do to deal with it? And, and that's it. Highly sensitive people go, what if we keep polluting? What if we go to war here? What if they were thought of as the priestly advisors? They're the Merlins of the world, this 15 to 20%. Margaret Mead's quote is, don't doubt that a small group of thoughtful people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And so it's a group of, of people who range from Abraham Lincoln, other people on the list would be a lot of musicians, and we'll go with like Barbara Streisand, who's known for having mood swings, but also being a perfectionist. Bob Dylan's a good example. Actors are uh, Nicole Kidman, Nicolas Cage. Actually, uh, some of the movies that come to mind that show the trait of high sensitivity would be the movie The Hours, I think from just a couple of years ago. It was a movie about Virginia Woolf, who was a highly sensitive person, played by Nicole Kidman, who was another person that I would definitely put on the list of being a highly sensitive person. Also, Julianne or Juliet, Julianne Moore uh, was in it. And it's a, it's a depressing movie. Unfortunately, the trait of high sensitivity, along with these great gifts, also comes sometimes with a high price tag. That brings us to the fact that if you have the trait of high sensitivity, and if you're from a highly functioning, nurturing family, you'll do very well. You may turn out to be the Steven Spielbergs of the world. Lannis Morissette, a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, musician right now, has an album called So Called Chaos. And the first time I listened to it, I said, wait a second, that's like an anthem for highly sensitive people. And then the next song, I go, holy goodness, or something like that. Um, <laughs> This is a person who understands, who is a highly sensitive person, and in her songs it really uh, shares what the trade is all about. 
Other people who, who would be on the list uh, would include like a Woody Allen. Now there's an example of kind of neurotic and but a very a very bright guy, a genius. Uh, in addition to the hours, movies like the French film Amelie is a good example of someone exhibiting the trait of high sensitivity and a great imagination. There's also uh, A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe and another movie, I believe, by Ron Howard called The Green Mile. Adaptation with Nicolas Cage, another person that I would put on the list as showing the characteristic of the trait of high sensitivity. On TV, some of you, and I think I have a, 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 a mix of ages in the crowd, but those of you who go back far enough to be uh, fans of the TV show MASH, I would say Radar O'Reilly is a good example of a highly sensitive person. He knew what people were going to say before they said it. He was very intuitive. He was very bright. Also willing to have kind of a menial role, but a very important one. Highly sensitive people aren't highly motivated by money. They care more about what's right, a universal justice. Uh, greed and going after money is very secondary. Once again, not something that uh, we in the United States see as the ideal. Another TV show that comes to mind is, that I enjoy, is uh, Monk. Adrian Monk, the uh, obsessive compulsive disorder uh, detective, but he always notices everything. Uh, it, it is an example of, of a highly sensitive character uh, currently on television. Oh, this I, I was thinking that the, the lady who cuts my hair, her husband happened to be a, like a national speaker and a psychologist and uh, a child psychologist and uh, therapist. And I gave her one of my, this is a few years ago, I gave her one of my highly sensitive people uh, business cards and it got back to Bob's hands and I won't use the last name. And he sent back the message, don't go there, Jim. I'm up on this stuff. I've never heard about the trait of high sensitivity. It can't be valid. I said, well, let me, I think someone's saying, yeah, it would be nice if all therapists learned about it. And the Dr. Elaine Aaron book is a good example because it has the, some of the science that many people need. And I think this Bob needed the, the science and there was enough there for him. So I sent him a copy of the highly sensitive people self-test. And I get an email back. He was at a psychologist conference in Orlando, Florida. I get an email back saying, Oh my God, I'm a highly sensitive person. Um, I took the test. This is very important. All caps, three exclamation marks, to a highly sensitive person that's yelling. Don't send highly sensitive people emails, all caps. It blows their circuitry a little. Um, so anyway, he is now referring me to uh, books. And he's doing research, and he's now including some of my material, which he's now embracing. And another example of that is I had a, a nice long three-page email from a lady in Belgium. And she said, boy, this is so helpful. I've never heard about this. Your website is me. Uh, it's going to really help me and many people I come in contact with. And she said, and having been a marriage, family, therapist, and counselor for the last 20 years, it'll come in handy. And I'm realizing the, the fact that it is such an important trait uh, has sometimes been mislabeled or it'll go under uh, another category. I think that all highly sensitive people are introverted. They, they, they get energy, they get overwhelmed, they get energy from the Cells. Uh, a non-HSP probably gets energized by being out and about and in a crowd. Uh, highly sensitive people are, their energy is sucked out of them in a crowd and they get overwhelmed. And that's one thing that is kind of a typical characteristic of highly sensitive people is the fact that they do get overwhelmed. And one thing I suggest uh, is to set boundaries, to learn to say no. Highly sensitive people are some of the most caring and giving and wonderful people you could ever meet. And in some cases, they're people pleasers. And they will go to a level that's uncomfortable. And if they take care of themselves, 
which includes proper diet, getting enough rest and exercise, uh, meditation is good, um, it, it all helps. And then, then they're able to function well. And one of my goals is not just to have HSPs uh, function and cope with their uh, trait, but to excel with it. What I like is that a story about fish. Dr. Elaine Aaron in her book talks about they were doing research. This also is very telling about how we skew research and how what we hold up as the ideal. And that is they were doing some tests, I believe it was in Japan, and they had like a hundred low fish or something, and they had a trap, and of the hundred fish, about eighty of them went in and got caught. And the others hung back. And there's always some that are a little more cautious. But the research said that the timid, the shy, the afraid ones didn't get caught. And Dr. Elaine Aaron's comment is, why didn't they say the smart ones didn't get caught? But that shows you how we kind of see boldness and the go where no man has gone before and stuff as more of the, uh, uh, the ideal. A uh, quote from Pearl S. Buck recipient of the Pulitzer Prize and the Nobel Prize for Literature said about highly sensitive people are creative people and creative people are all very, very sensitive. The quote goes, the highly creative mind is no more than this, a human creature born abnormally, inhumanely sensitive. To him, a touch is a blow, a sound is a noise, a misfortune is a tragedy, a joy is an ecstasy, a lover, I'm sorry, a friend is a lover, a lover is a god, and failure is death, unquote. Uh, that also brings up the subject that highly sensitive people talk in what I call extreme languaging. So if someone doesn't like, an HSP doesn't like someone, they don't say, I don't care for them, they say, I hate them. And that kind of languaging seems to escalate situations quite uh, often. The other thing is I think that the reason they do that is in many cases highly sensitive people have always felt that they weren't being heard and in some cases they use this more extreme languaging or severe languaging to get themselves heard. Other tips would include to take care of yourself and if you're in a couple where there's one highly sensitive person and, and another one who isn't, oftentimes if you don't understand that your that your partner is highly sensitive and you go to a party or to a function and then the highly sensitive person gets overwhelmed and wants to leave, the uneducated partner might say, what's wrong, we just got here. Uh, uh, what are you, being a party pooper? Uh, you know, this and, and it starts an argument, and then when you've got highly sensitive people who might then escalate or use stronger language, it uh, can become very uncomfortable quickly. I have learned, and what I suggest is if you're going to go to a party, and it's all, you know, it's good sometimes even for business to go to a party or something, and say, this is important to me to go. How about if we just stay 15 minutes? And after 15 minutes, if you're not comfortable, we can leave. And there's something about that, but then after 15 minutes, you say, how are you doing? To your highly sensitive partner, whether it's the man or the woman in the relationship. And if they're okay, you stay and you wind up having a very lovely evening. But if you don't have that control, and to highly sensitive people, to feel out of control is maybe the, one of the worst feelings they can have, is to feel out of control. So if you give them that control factor, to know that after 15 minutes, if things aren't going well or you're not comfortable, you can leave. It helps a lot. There was some research done where someone was hooked up to electricity. You know, like, how much electricity can you take? And if the person had the off button, the kill button, knew they could escape at any time, they could take, like, three times as much pain. And I think it's sort of the same with HSPs. If they know they're in control, if they know they have the support of their partner, if they know they have an out, and if they're at the mall or something, if they learn to say, hey, if I'm starting to feel overwhelmed, I can always go to my car, I can put the seat back, I can put on some nice music, knowing that that will help them recoup and regenerate and be able to continue functioning. 
the, the therapist I was talking about who emailed me from Florida then wanted to get together and talk about things and he would tell me stories and I could tell him the, basically the predictable behavior of what I see happens with highly sensitive people. He was doing research and one of his friends said, could you go to the, uh, I think it was a video conference in Los Angeles. And he said, sure, I'll be happy to just check out a video game or something this guy was working on. So the guy drives down from the mountains, and that is one thing that highly sensitive people really appreciate, nature, being alone. Being on a cruise is a wonderful example of the water. I, one of the tips and one of the things I recommend is water, even to the point of a lake or a fountain or a swimming pool or even a fountain in your office. I found people who can put a fountain in their house or in their office there's something about the water that calms them and uh, calms their nervous system. So he drove down from Lake Arrowhead, which is a good place for NHSP to live, drove through traffic in LA, we have bad traffic. He then paid his $8 to park. He then walked up to the, the door of the conference center, put his hand on the door and couldn't open it and wound up getting back in his car and driving up to the mountain, but not feeling well. And I said, well, what, what else happened? What, were you, what, was, what was happening? Turned out he hadn't gotten much rest the night before. So his threshold for pain was down a little. He then drove, which is stimulating in the bad traffic. He then opened the parking lot. And as he walked up, he then remembered he saw the strobe lights flashing and the woofers woofing. And he put his hand on the door and he couldn't open it. And he didn't understand why. But when I explained to him, if he had prepared a little more or sat in his car and gotten into a calmer, more energized state, he might have been able to go in. His wife told me another story where they were going to go and check about cars, and they were going to go to the new car show, and they were going to check out, I think, four cars. So he drove down from the mountain again, went in, checked out two cars, he then wanted to leave. And she said, what do you mean you want to leave? We came all this way, we have these other cars, and it started an argument. And that comes back to the fact that if you know you can leave for a little while, get some acknowledgement there, if you know you can leave for a little while, take a break, go to the car, rest, something, you can accomplish a lot more. So uh, it's, it's very important to learn those things and how to deal with the trait of high sensitivity. I had some, uh, some note cards, and I will pass them out. I'll turn this off for a second and see if there's any questions, or if there's any questions now. I know a couple people handed me one, but uh, any questions on this, I know? Yes. Yeah, actually, I'm curious, Jim. Given that you say that you're not a highly sensitive person, why were you so interested uh, in the topic and started to work with that? Good question. Yeah. I have people in my family and in my life, and at the time that it all started, I had a girlfriend who was different, and I started putting this stuff together, and when you get 180,000 people a month thanking you for doing it and saying they're getting help from it, I think the uh, helping people and, and having it become almost a mission. I, I, I work with a highly sensitive guy who's my webmaster. He has gone so far as to say, I didn't know about this, he is, he is learning to deal with his trait much better. He figures maybe he was put on this planet to help me get this message up. And uh, that sounds maybe pompous, I'm not sure, but it's uh, getting some good acknowledgement there, so I appreciate that. And it seems to be one of those things where, um, I guess that's one of the reasons I'm here. One of my philosophies of life is we're on earth to serve others, and in this way, I can see people be served. I also have written some articles and uh, have been interviewed a number of times uh, have a book in the works just to get the information out. And the fact that I'm not highly sensitive. I've been told by Elaine Aaron that maybe the trait of high sensitivity needs someone like me who isn't highly sensitive. Because highly sensitive people would ruminate on it, it would never be perfect enough, and they might not get around to it. Where anyone who knows me, I don't think good enough is good enough, but I think perfect enough is. And so that's what I shoot for. Um, in closing, and then I'll answer some questions, I had written these up. In closing, the idea to pause to check. If that's something that ruminates with you, there's a chance you're a highly sensitive person. I wanted to give credit 
to Dr. Elaine Yarn, who brought it to my attention. Some of the characteristics. Awareness of subtleties. Organization. They are all gifted. Hardworking. They tend to worry a lot. And then they worry about what they worried about. And anytime you do that, it can go to a bad place. They like to be in control. They may become overwhelmed and will then need to get away, sometimes to a dark and quiet room to rejuvenate and uh, recoup. They are very loyal. They have mood swings. Uh, I at first thought it was just, just, I thought it was PMS, but it takes it to another level. When your nervous system is different and everything affects you severely, uh, PMS can be a big issue, as well as uh, high sensitive people seem to have a lot of problems with insomnia. There's other, Depending on the stability of your family, I don't know if I completed that thought. The idea that if you're from a stable family, a nurturing family, you wind up being a Steven Spielberg or, or someone who succeeds. If you're from a non-nurturing family, if you had an absentee dad or a, or a chemically imbalanced mother or something, your life is real, real tough. And uh, I'm hoping that some of the information I give out will help people protect themselves, set boundaries, and... Uh, and uh, Cope with life better and excel in life. Some of the others are startled easily. Avoids violent movies and TV shows. Don't like crowds. That's why I had a number of people who showed up and I was thrilled that they showed up knowing that, uh, that crowds, the idea of being in nature and being on the water is a great thing, but the idea of crowds was uh, a bit of a, a, an overwhelm and a negative. Comfort around water. And uh, one of the big things is a deep appreciation of art and nature and music. Uh, I have, a, I have a, a person who works in the office who is on the level of being a concert pianist. And she plays it wonderfully. I think she's worn out three. Uh, uh, Baldwin, what are the uh, sine waves, actually sine wave pianos. And her brother is highly sensitive, and now she kind of understands it. Her brother will cry when she's playing the piano, because he's so moved by it. She's not highly sensitive. She, she, she plays it and appreciates music, but a highly sensitive person can be deeply moved by art, music, nature. And when you learn that about your partner, it can be very helpful. Uh, one thing I look at it is, it's as if they have no skin. I was looking for one of those medical pictures of the human body that's all intact except it has no skin. So I thought that was a pretty good representation of what a highly sensitive person can be like. That goes along with the article in Oprah this week that is the... Oh, here it is right here. In this month's Oprah, it's the sponge people, and it talks about how you can be affected by other people's energy. Now, I have copies of that for other people. In relationships, I didn't touch upon that enough, in relationships, highly sensitive people have a tendency to be so intuitive and their feelings, their feelings become the reality. So they'll sometimes find someone who they think is Mr. Right or Ms. Mr. You know, Ms. Right, and they will move the relationship along too quickly, and then later may find out that they're uh, bonded to a person who's not that nice. So I suggest they take it real slow and easy and uh, get to know the person and override that sense that they found their soulmate, which uh, happens so, so quickly. Ooh, here's a good one to do much clothes on. HSP equals nice. Yes, no. Highly sensitive people can be some of the nicest, most caring, wonderful people you could ever meet. But since they process things so deeply, they also seem to be aware of what would really hurt another person. And when you process something so deeply, they can become... Uh, the example on one of the, the, one of the guys on the radio show was on thought that a peacock was a good example. They look lovely and everything is swell, but if you corner them or do them wrong, 
they can be very, very vicious. And so we have an acknowledgement of a peacock in the back there. They are all gifted. Um, once again, not all gifted people are highly sensitive, but all highly sensitive people are gifted. It was once said that they are high maintenance, and in many cases that can be true, but oftentimes the price is so worth uh, the trouble. And if you deal with them, the extreme languaging, uh, don't be thrown off by the, the escalating language. It, it, it is something they use because they feel they need to to get their point across. Ooh, I did that kind of stuff. Cutting people out of your life. I uh, I brought that up at a I have a highly sensitive people meetup that meets once a month in Los Angeles, and I, I I realized I kept hearing this that people were cutting people out of their life. I originally called it turning on people, which didn't go well with highly sensitive people. <laughs> but uh, cutting people out of life, you can understand that, and it's virtually every one of them had done it. And I think it's a defense mechanism to protect themselves. They only have so much energy, and if they're around people who, who drain them or give them the negative energy and they soak up too much of that toxicity, toxicity they need to get away, and so they do so. Uh, Dr. Barry Yeager, who wrote the book, Making Work Work for the Highly Sensitive Person, I had heard one of the meetups, and I said, have you, I find, I, I kind of, do a little research, and I say, do you find you've cut people out of your life? She goes, no. And I go, oh, that's unusual, but there seems to be so much predictable behavior. And she said, no, when I find people that don't have the right energy, and stuff, I just avoid them from then on. <laughs> and I go, okay. Uh, and so there's a, but they're, they're, they are so sensitive, highly sensitive, you may not like the phrase, so I've learned to rephrase things or couch it a little differently, and that, that sometimes can be good. The platinum rule, I think we're all familiar with the golden rule, the platinum rule is do unto others as they would want to be done unto. <laughs> so it's a matter of, with highly sensitive people, don't use yourself as the benchmark. Get into their head if you can a little. Realize what their wants and needs are, and, and and that will help a relationship greatly. Thank you very much for coming. Now I'm going to take questions, and uh, I appreciate you showing up. Thank you very much. Yes? You mentioned that uh, highly sensitive people have a different, I believe you used the word different, nervous system. Have there been any studies, and are you speaking about physiologically, uh, can you address that? Yes, it's, uh, there is enough science, and the psychologist who was having a little trouble, the psychiatrist was having a little trouble, because there wasn't enough science. It is starting to be more and more science behind it. Uh, a lot of the stuff I talk about is uh, anecdotal, but it seems to be so consistent. And uh, it has been called introverted, and it's been called shy, and it seems to be coming together to be understood and seen as a trait that is an inherited trait where people have a ner different nervous system. They're bothered by lights. I know certain people who will show up at <laughs> events. He's laughing because it was him. And they can't stay because the lighting is wrong or they don't have enough space or they're just not comfortable. They don't feel in control. And all of that has uh, kind of been validated by enough science. Uh, once again, I, I'm not the science guy, but I'll really, something. Yes. Uh, Dr. John Medina, Calories Lab, is doing some extraordinary work on the study of the hypothalamus in identical twins to determine PTSD sensitivity. Are we traumatized to be highly sensitive or are we genetically uh, part of it? So I refer you to Calories Lab in Seattle, Washington, Dr. John Medina. Thank you. And it, it's interesting and, and it's a good question because there are people who who have never heard of it, and they go, well, if it's valid, I would have heard of it. I happen to be doing some stuff 
with a guy who's the head of the Cedar sinai Medical Mental Health Area. And he calls up and goes, could you link us to your website? Because we don't get as many hits as you do. And um, it is something that I keep waiting to have someone show me where I'm really wrong. And uh, so far, there's been enough science and my experience and when I interview all these people or ask questions, it's just amazing how consistent it is. Yes? Jim, a lot of the traits that you describe, I can say, oh, I'm like that, or I'm my husband, or whatever, but are there different levels? Or how do you diagnose if you are highly sensitive or not? Thank you, and I didn't ask her to set that up. Uh, there is a self-test, 27 questions that I'll hand out, and it's something to think about. The amazing part is that there are people who answer these 100% yes, a couple of those in the audience, I think, and a lot of people, particularly non-HSPs, they don't, they, they don't answer one of them yes. And so it's a matter of, of night and day, and, um, and the 15 to 20% of the population that that does have the trait, they don't feel like they belong on this planet. They feel that different. So when you when we take the test or when you take the test, it'll be interesting to see where you come on the chart. Because yes, there are some that are that are more uh, classic examples. But it seems to be either you are or you aren't. That's uh, and so I hope that answers the question. For the sake of the tape, would you be so kind as to list? what those characteristics are. Let me just read the list of questions. Yes. And that, uh, I think there's 27 here. And the idea is answer true if it's somewhat true for you, and answer no or false if it is not very true or not true at all for you. Number one, I am easily overwhelmed by strong sensory input. Number two, I seem to be aware of subtleties in my environment. And I'll say this isn't my guess, this is Dr. Elaine Aaron's test, and it sounds fairly benign or generic, but she assures me it's been refined and it is a very valid test, so we'll see how this uh, group, what they think at the end here. Number three, other people's moods can affect me. I tend to be very sensitive to pain. I find myself needing to withdraw during busy days into bed or into a darkened room or any place where I can have some privacy and relief from stimulation. That needing alone time. Needing alone time is kind of like they also need to be creative. And the combination there, if you need alone time and you are very creative, you're well on your way to qualifying. Particularly sensitive to the effects of caffeine. I've had a couple of people who question that one, but I think it's once again being um, affected by, since your nervous system is more sensitive, uh, you can certainly be affected by both caffeine and other, other drugs. I have a rich, complex inner life, which leads to very vivid dreams. And depending on if you have a lot of issues in your life, it can also lead to horrible nightmares. Very vivid, horrible nightmares. I am made uncomfortable by loud noises. Sirens going by, startling noises, loud crowds. They are the first ones to put earplugs in because they're a nervous system. I can be deeply moved by arts and music. My nervous system sometimes feels so frazzled that I just have to get away by myself. I am conscientious. I startle easily. I get rattled when there is a lot to do in a short period of time. That brings up an interesting uh, story that my the guy I work with, the boss will come in and say, we need to get this out by five o'clock. And the example of with highly sensitive people, not highly sensitive people, it's either fight or flight. I use sensitive people have in the third one. It's called freezing, and they can become incapacitated. And so the tip I tell him about is, or I've seen him use, and he's taken, he's brought it to a fine art, and then he's saying, I can't get it done. 
And then the boss will say, well, when can you get it done? He's like, get it done tomorrow sometime. And the boss begrudgingly stops off. And about a half an hour later, the project's done. So the idea of giving yourself control and giving yourself an out can be very important to take the pressure off you, even if it's an artificial pressure. Also, when he starts to feel overstimulated, my suggestion is go to the bathroom, get away. And that seems to, to work well. So if you have a, enough of these tips and strategies, you can uh, protect yourself better. I get rattled when I have a lot to do in a short period of time. When people are uncomfortable in a physical environment, I tend to know the needs or what needs to be done to make them more comfortable, like changing the lighting or the seating. Once again, it's picking up on, on vibrations and energy, which if you're not HSP, sounds a little ooey-wooey, as I call it, but a uh, highly sensitive person, it uh, seems to be the way it is. Being very hungry can create strong reactions in me, sometimes disrupting my concentration and changing my mood. It's a good idea to have protein bars in the glove box. I try very hard to avoid making mistakes or forgetting things. That's an example of where there's a temptation to set up perfection as the goal. And when you have perfection as a goal, it leads to disappointment and frustration. So make excellence a goal, not perfection. I make a point of avoiding violent movies and TV shows. I become unpleasantly aroused when, I'm, when a lot is going on around me. Being very hungry can create strong reactions in me, sometimes disrupting my concentration and changing my mood. And uh, if you're with a highly sensitive person, to protect them sometimes from themselves, make sure there is some uh, nutrition available. Big changes in my life can shake me up or bother or upset me. I notice and enjoy delicate and fine scents, tastes, sounds, and works of art. I find it unpleasant or unnerving to have a lot going on around me at once. I'm getting a lot of nods from the audience on this. I make a high priority to attempt to arrange my life to avoid upsetting or overwhelming situations. I'm hoping to make it so people are more aware that they need to protect themselves and avoid stimulating situations. I am bothered by intense stimuli like loud noises or chaotic scenes or activities. When I must compete or be observed while performing a task, I become so nervous and shake and uncomfortable that I do much worse than I would otherwise. And I see that happen. Computer classes and taking classes for school online seems to be a blessing to them. They can take it when they are feeling up to it and they don't have the pressure of a teacher or someone or a specific time frame. And last but not least, when I was a child, my parents or teachers seemed to see me as sensitive or shy. Fourteen or more. If you answer yes or it's true for you, fourteen or more of those 27 questions, there's a good likelihood that you may be highly sensitive and have a very high sensitivity. All right? Yes? I have a couple. Oh, well, I have lots. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one, a uh, couple comments and then question. Um, the no skin that you talked about, uh -huh. one of the ways that I described it is I feel like a burn victim. Well, I like that. I mean, I don't like that, but, but I, thank yeah, you. It's yeah. a, you know, if you come near me, you know, it's like, you know, how burn victim they can Yeah, handle. yeah. I've also heard that it's like not having a raincoat on. And the rest of us in the world, it's raining down on us, and we have our raincoats, and highly sensitive people don't have a raincoat. And so they soak it up, and they get drenched, and they get uh, affected by it. The question is, do you ever recover? Uh, it's sort of like recovering from having blue eyes. No, it's a trait. Uh, you learn to deal with it. You learn to adapt. You learn to take care of yourself. Right. And with the right medication, Yes. And in many cases, highly sensitive people like to be in control. So sometimes they don't like to take the medication because they feel that it's artificial. But with the right medication and all, and therapy, and understanding it, and having a support group, having a church or a uh, 
a group that supports you and understands you can be very helpful. But no, it, 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 you don't get cured of it. You, yes? You know, look at it the other way around. Everybody else is not highly sensitive. They're the muggles. <laughs> Okay. That's a reference to Lord of the Rings that no, I learned yesterday. The Hobbit. The Hobbit. Not sorry, sorry, sorry. To Harry Potter. Harry, Harry Potter. Potter. Okay. And they're all also wizards. Didn't read. All wizards. <laughs> Neither. Yeah. Wizard world and all non wizards. Okay. So highly sensitive people have such vivid memories and memories, imaginations and all. We're good. This is the kind of stuff they really relate to, and the idea of being on a foreign world or planet or something. Is, is a comfort to them because they can relate to that. So really trying to learn who I am. Yeah, yeah just, just live in the world you're in. It's a good world. It's a very rich world. It's an enriching world if you allow it to be. If you quit excusing yourself for being who you are, you've right. got a great gift to give. But nobody else can give. That's true with everybody anyway, but even more so. Even it. more so with HSPs, the Margaret Mead quote is an example. And a lot of highly sensitive people don't understand how gifted they are and what a good thing they have because they get caught up in the depression or the anxiety or the insomnia or something else that seems uh, uh, wrong. They seem like they're, they're, they're broken. It's not a flaw. It's not a character weakness. It is a trait that you have. Take care of yourself and let the good side flourish. And by knowing about it and knowing there's a community out there, a lot of people say, I thought I was the only one, I thought I was crazy. To just to know that there are 15 to 20 percent of the population that can relate to most all of this is very comforting when you feel you're not alone. Yes? Why does the answer have to be medication? I didn't say that it has to be medication. In many cases, the uh, medication is the last resort, yeah. but I'm saying it can be very helpful. And what type I think there are other in the audience who could list the. Uh, uh, yeah. Pat, could you join in? Uh, sure. You know, why are you putting. Yeah. I would think that's the last resort. This is uh, Dr. Pat Allen, uh, noted psychotherapist and a highly sensitive person, I might say. And it, she reminds me of another a story. It's, it's people who are in control and are terrific, like Johnny Carson or David Letterman or some of those, once the camera goes off and once they're out of control, they can be very different. They're not comfortable anymore. They, 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 they evaporate. Johnny Carson was known for having drinking situations or issues and also... Not that I have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we address the, the question of whether or not medication seems to be appropriate from time yeah. to time. Right. Uh, um, as a highly sensitive person, when I was a little tiny girl, I could not even be in a classroom. I had to be in the back of the room in a chair by myself. And my mother said, still waters run deep. When the kids were reading Dick and Jane, I was reading the Encyclopedia Britannica. It was just a strange world. Uh, and I did take up drinking at five. I drank my father's leftovers, and I was sedated from five to 35. That was my street medicine. But at 35, uh, it, it was destroying me. And so I want you to know that um, coming out of alcohol, I had to go on medication, had to go on medication. And I was unable to sleep more than two hours a night. On and on and on and on. And now I want you all to know this. This is really important. You know, Sigmund Freud just made fun of, is that correct? Yeah. Oh, we're now scientifically validating that which he intuitively knew. And here's what he said, and I didn't interrupt, I'm grateful I didn't, but that we know that the prefrontal lobe is where the inspirational, motivational stimulation arises in the brain. And this is the exact center of dreaming. The exact center of dreaming. And so what I was doing in those hours of staying up and staying up and staying up and staying up, like I was on cocaine, was I was really being driven mad. I had a blood pressure of 250 over 148 for much of my adult life. Right now, my blood pressure is 110 over 70. I'm healthier now 
than I ever was when I was young. And it's because I know and have always known that I was different, that I was gifted, that I was brilliant, that I didn't fit. That for me, the torture of being in a one-on-one -on -one relationship is so excruciating, it takes me years to make a friend. But all of my friends, who are very few, know what it takes to be my friend. I am so much more comfortable in front of a zillion people, because there's no intimacy, that I make my living doing this. And the ability to be sensitive to another person's vibrations is how I make a living. They say I'm psychic. I'm not psychic. I'm just an old HSP. And I am blessed to have Pat Allen in my life and to be one of her friends and the information she teaches. And it was really easy making friends, wasn't it? Yeah, right. <laughs> and I really liked you, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, right. Is that true? No, she didn't like me. How long have we known each other? About 10 years. And how long have we been friends? Less than 10 years. <laughs> Uh, this human being, this this Microphone. human being, in uh, the 30 years that I've been a therapist, everybody knows I'm a good product, but they don't know that I'm not who I appear to be. There is no Pat Allen. There is no Pat Allen. I'm a highly sensitive person who has a gig. I have a gimmick. And people think this is me. And so what they do is they attack me, they fight with me, they do all the things that keep them outside my world. This is the first human being with the marketing skills that will perhaps, dear God, help me finish my life carrying the message. And I want to thank you for doing that. So I may be his first client. <laughs> It's also been uh, uh, terrific in, in helping me understand people in my life who uh, have the fear of high sensitivity, and that's been a blessing too. And it's not just me anecdotally finding this stuff out, but the lady here who may be politically incorrect but scientifically accurate validates most everything. I have yet to find anything that, that, that we are buttheads on. So that right there is a nice reassurance that I has something important and it's heading in the right direction. Oh, very, very, very much. Um, I don't have it codified like you do. In fact, it's the first time I've ever really heard it. I hear him talking at dinner. And so what I'm saying is, you have impressed me. Okay. This is very informative. It has codified that which I have experienced in ways that allow me, I, I've, I love me. But it codifies it so I can think about it and speak about it and hear you speak about it in a way that allows me to know that you too are on this planet to help other human beings who suffer seriously trying to be human. And I'm one of them. Thank you. Uh, I have a chapter in a book called uh, Chopped Liver for the Loving Spirit. And the whole idea is knowing, having the understanding, understanding can lead to love and make love possible. Otherwise, it can be very difficult if, if you're in a relationship with someone who isn't highly sensitive. And I promote the idea of having two highly sensitive people get along a lot better than one highly sensitive and one not highly sensitive. But when you've got two, you have, in my opinion, more risks, but you can have a much more a richer life because that non-highly sensitive person will will make you think outside your comfort level and be willing to protect you if he understands that and uh, and, and so you can have a, a bigger life. The idea of, of someone with four kids that you have to desensitize yourself, you have to learn to have some coping skills and that comes and I can I will figure that she probably had a decent functional family, which unfortunately seems to be becoming less and less of the norm.
And I'm still amazed to have so many people, and I keep waiting for someone to email me with saying, well, Jim, you said that, but that, no. And, and I, the, the closest thing I've had is someone who may not be affected by caffeine. And then the other one is uh, people who say, I don't cut people out of my life. I only avoid them from then on. You know, so it's a matter of semantics then. Uh, any other questions? Oh. What is the best way to deal with an HSP when they get in a... Fulminating Leave them alone. Actually, they brought up an interesting thing. Highly sensitive people need to get away very often. They almost need their privacy and their alone time like the rest of us need air. And I used to follow that person and learn know what was wrong. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what you do, huh? Yeah. And you learn that, that that is not a good thing to do and will usually escalate into an argument of some sort. So the best thing to do if they're in a funk is ask them if there's anything you can do to help them feel better. Uh, learn what they might appreciate, whether it's a, a bowl of oatmeal or a, a glass of water or, a, you know, something. But to not continue to invade their space because it's, uh, it's, it's uncomfortable for them. What was that? It's an invasion of space, and it's very, it's interesting. A lot of the stuff that non-HSPs take for granted or think is the norm, they have to kind of turn it the other way around when you're working with the highly sensitive people. Uh, he's got me under a contract that says, before I X him for my life, I have to warn him that he's being x <laughs> It sounds silly, but highly sensitive people have this tendency to cut people out of their lives as if they're not even on the planet. Uh, any other questions? So yes. we wouldn't be a non-sensitive. What personality? Because I think everyone's sensitive. That's very interesting because people who... Uh, but, but, uh, who famous would you say wouldn't be a non-sensitive? Uh, George Bush is a yeah, sensitive. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's probably a pretty classic example. Uh, let me, these are sensitive, and then we'll figure out kind of the counterpart to them. That might be helpful. Albert Einstein, Carl Jung, Emily Dickinson, Charles Darwin, Abraham Lincoln, Catherine Hepburn, Lee Allen, Queen Elizabeth II, Orson Welles, Walt Disney, Ansel Adams, there's great stories. If you read about some of these people, I've been asked, some will say, but the trait of high sensitivity wasn't around when Ansel Adams was around. But you study his life and you realize he is a classic uh, example, and not only with his talents and his traits and his creativity, but also uh, his interaction with his wife. He was out taking photographs when his first child was born. Because he was into the creative thing. It's I call amazing. It insensitive. Say again? I call it insensitive. You know, that's sort of like the idea of saying HSPs are nice. They can be wonderfully nice. They can also be very not nice. Nicole Kidman, Nicolas Cage, Steven Spielberg, Jane Goodall, someone out in the jungle with a bunch of gorillas is a good example of a highly sensitive person. An interesting one is Warren Buffett. Brilliant man, but also a bit of a recluse, and, uh, and uh, I think that would probably also go with Howard Hughes. Barbara Streisand, I mentioned. Michael Jordan. Elton John. Bob Dylan. Jim Morrison. Jewel. Alanis Morissette. And a real good example is Princess Di. I mean, everything from her uh, eating disorder to her visionary, wanting the world to be a better place and get rid of landmines, um, maybe a little paranoia, but if you take it to an extreme, I think that existed there too, and wanted to be perfect, and uh, so a highly sensitive person. So, yes? Are highly sensitive people? 
people more prone to eating disorders? Mm -hmm. I believe they're more prone to most addictions and eating disorders. Their, their, their nervous systems being tweaked. Another example of, of you made me think of is on a chart where a non-highly sensitive person might be bored sitting for let's say 10 minutes not talking a highly sensitive person actually embraces that and where I might be a little stimulated they're getting pretty stimulated when I'm like ready to go to another party or after out to dinner uh, in many cases they're reaching a point of overwhelm which can also then uh, make mood changes they can be kind of cranky and they may start a fight so it's uh, but it seems to happen regularly yes how important is the, the dreaming part in asking that question extreme it's it's extremely so, because the dreaming we laughed at freud until we realized that now we know that the prefrontal lobe is the inspirational, motivational part of our brain and that when energy is coming through, through inspiration or through motivation, that it triggers that prefrontal lobe to, to create these dreams. But the problem with the dreams is it keeps you up, which doesn't allow you to release serotonin, which means you're deprived and you're condemned to depression, which then calls you to use some form of mind-altering chemical, whether it's street drugs or whatever. So we're just coming into awareness that this theoretical framework, you see, and, and our new science is very, very congruent now. So if I had answered all the questions yet, except for that. Which yeah. one? The one about dreaming. If I well, if you answer the rest of them, you had a bad enough time in your waking hours not to have to fuss around and dream. A person who's not highly sensitive sleeps, they walk about the planet, they get mad when it's time to get mad, they don't go into these strange, these strange funks. I have grown artificial skin. I know where I can't go, I know my limitations, I know other people aren't like me, I know I'm not like them, I'm just different. But if I know my boundaries and I stay in my boundaries, then I can look like a normie and I'm rebuilding relationships where they weren't. Do you see? So I want you to understand that what Elaine, or when I read it, I didn't, you know, I didn't talk to you. Too you and I were not talking. <laughs> and the reason we were, I was mad at him is because he was in a friendship with somebody that betrayed me. I outed that person and everybody in their life. He didn't do anything. He just went with the, with the crew. Did you see? So a person who is not highly sensitive can take care of themselves. And a person who is highly sensitive has to learn skills. Um, I wanted to ask a question who? about Jim, me, uh, us. Um, empathy. One more time. Empathy. Empathy. Empathy, empathy and because yes, absolutely. In fact, but go ahead and finish your question.
It, it seems very in keeping with yes, yeah, with Yeah, just sitting here, just one of the traits which. Being very intuitive wasn't on the maybe on the test, but yes, I'd say that that is one of the consistencies. This test, I think, is from 1997 or 1996, was upgraded and seems to be a benchmark and seems to be valid. There are probably other things that, that become involved and would be valid also. All right. Thank you very much, Pat, and thank you very much.